David Killalay at the end, he runs the metrics lab, and so he measures things. And for me, he's been really helpful in um, understanding a, a lot of what's going on and trying to assimilate this information. When Bob asked me to sit on this session, he said if I could cover everything else that wasn't talked about <laughs> before. But I think you could probably imagine my job's done. Uh, I think we did cover almost everything else. Um, I am, uh, just for disclosure, I am a nutrition guy. I do biochemistry. I don't do bread work. I've never made a loaf of bread in my life. I'm inspired by Michael's book, but I haven't yet. I think I'll start with pickles first. That was, that was intriguing. Um, I actually started on this venture through in a conversation with Bob about uh, wine. And um, I have this interesting little side project on looking at minerals and wine and uh, Bob talked to me, hit me with something out of left field. Well, what about terroir and wheat? And I had never heard of such a concept. I'm sure he remembers the look on my face as it was quiet for a 10 or 20 seconds there as I was trying to process exactly what he was asking me. Um, really, I had always approached wheat like it was water or something else that's just provided in your diet and you don't really care about any of that stuff. It's just there, it's pasta, you put something delicious on top of it. Um, that was about two years ago, and um, after being pulled down that rabbit hole, I would say it's, uh, I am quite impressed with what I've learned. Um, so again, this is all coming from someone who focuses mainly on new, um, minerals, but um, micronutrients in general. I have been helping out Bob with the metrics, as he mentioned. Uh, we don't, he, I don't get any salary from uh, community grains, so there's, that's my disclosure. The only thing uh, Bob is Community Grains has paid for a few of the supplies to do some of the testing that we do. Um, but we're, I'm particularly interested in vitamins and minerals, and the seed of the wheat contains an enormous amount of vitamins and minerals. We talk about it in terms of density. So you can certainly go eat a large Zachary's pizza and re receive, after eating a whole Zachary's pizza, a lot of vitamins and minerals. But that's distributed through a lot of fat and carbohydrate. The wheat seed, however, is packed with nutrients and it is there to feed the baby plant. So that's one point worth talking about that was kind of hit on before. The plants are, the wheat plant is not making this for us. We have assimilated this product and we use it for our own nutritional needs. Um, I think it's uh, then interesting that we, of course, take the parts that are the most nutritious and get rid of them and use the rest of it for uh, convenience of making bread that rises easier or tastes sweeter or something like that. We don't think of wheat as a nutritional product. I mean, I've, I've had this conversation with many people who think of it as just a staple, and somehow staple translates differently as food to them, which is very different. I probably was of that same mindset, but uh, I'd certainly look at things very differently now. The micronutrients in wheat are dense. There are lots of them but they're not homogeneously distributed. Most of those nutrients tend to end up in the germ, which is the baby plant, or in the bran, particularly in certain layers right under the bran known as the alluron layer. And that, the germ and the alluron are the growing parts of the, of the seed. The uh, endosperm cells that hold all these carbohydrates are not living parts. The bran is essentially dead cells that have been packed on the edge, just like the dead, scales, uh, dead cells on our, form a barrier of our skin they're the barrier on the seed. The uh, richness of the micronutrients for, for uh, vitamins, you're looking at a lot of B vitamins, niacin, folates. Uh, there's also a very good amount of uh, vitamin A, that's the yellow color that you tend to see in, the, in flour when it's not bleached. Uh, there's also a lot of good vitamin E in there, and in particular, what's not really understood uh, widely is that there are multiple flavors, if you will, of vitamin E, not real flavors in the sense that you can taste it, but there are different uh, versions. So vitamin E is known chemically as tocopherol, and there is an alpha tocopherol, a beta tocopherol, and a gamma tocopherol. Those are all not the same thing. They do different things in our body. And for the most part, if you were to buy a supplement of vitamin E, they're gonna give you one simple chemical form of it that's easy for them to make, the alpha. It turns out that plant material tends to have a lot of gamma. And the gamma turns, is really important for the anti-inflammatory effects that uh, vitamin E has, not so much the alpha, and taking a huge amount of alpha as a supplement actually interferes with your ability to pull the other types of vitamin E out of food. So there's a lot of complexity there. I'll take a 
just a momentary tangent and uh, echo what Dr. Jacobs said, that we do tend to think reductionist. Uh, we, as scientists, um, it's really the name of the game, and I had someone ask me very recently, well, why? You always get up on a stage or, in, or talk to people and you say, it's our fault, we're reductionist, we're messing things up, we understand, so why do you do it? Uh, the answer to that question is we're trained that way. Uh, in graduate school, it was frowned upon to discuss complexity, and I uh, attended graduate school with a medical school, so I had medical school students in my class, and it was even worse for them. Uh, they, if it wasn't a simple mechanism that they could recapitulate uh, on a piece of paper on a Scantron sheet, it was not to be learned, and so it was ignored. So um, that was really hard for the analytic my medical students that I was in graduate school, that I was in school with, um, it just, they had to unlearn their ways of thinking and becoming so flowcharty about it. And so I think uh, that's n not all their fault. They're, it's the system. It also is the case, though, that um, several of us on the stage are, have been busy uh, and will continue to be writing grants. And we get most of our funding from the federal government, um, those of us who do biomedical research from the NIH. And it is incredibly difficult to get any funding from the government if you do not identify one single compound that you're studying and one single compound mechanism that you want to uncover. Um, for many years, you just couldn't get a grant. If you wanted to study traditional Chinese medicine, where there were seven or eight herbs all together in one dose, you couldn't do it. You would not get that funded. Um, a few years back, they finally opened up an office that works with alternative medicine, but as you can imagine, it's the least well-funded part of the NIH, and it continues to be a problem for Mark, who thinks in globally about all of these interactions of the microbiome and nutrition and anti-nutrients and the immune system. You can't put all of that in the grant. We can't fund things to do that that way. So secondly, a part of our problem in do getting this work, so why we keep saying we don't know, is because we actually can't get the money to do the work. and so. Finally, I'll say that the journalism and our ability to interact with the general public also is based on reductionism. And they want to hear that one message, um, the one key point from your study. And that is one thing, because I know there are a lot of journalists in the room, that's one thing that you could do that would help us out greatly, is if you could ask the next scientist that you interact with, tell me the complexity. Help me understand that. What else do you need to know? Uh, those things are rarely asked of us. And so that's why I really appreciate this venue because, as Bob calls it, it's complicated and we address, we accept that up front. And that's the premise. We can learn, still learn things that are complicated and we can still approach them redu with reduction, but we know that we're not going to have the complete picture until we're done. Okay, that was a little bit longer of a tangent than I thought it was going to be. Um, <laughs> that was more of a soapbox, and my apologies. Uh, micronutrients. There were, there's a lot of micronutrients in the, the wheat seed the B vitamins and E that I was talking about. There's also a lot of minerals, which is more of my interest. So there's a good deal of magnesium. It's a sleeper discussion topic in the nutrition world. Nobody seems to care about magnesium. It's becoming more popular on the internet now because they can sell it for almost every, every cause uh, can be solved with magnesium. But uh, it, it, we're hugely deficient in magnesium because it comes from green leafy vegetables and whole grains. And those are not things in the American diet that most people get in abundance. Uh, zinc and copper and manganese are also very abundant in the, in the wheat seed. And so those are also uh, things we need. Selenium, very well. So if you, come, if you just go to Wikipedia and look up wheat, scan down to the bottom, it gives you a nutritional chart, and it compares wheat to the other staple crops, corn, uh, rice, and it's just amazing how much more dense, nutrient-wise, the, the wheat is compared to those other products. So that you're... The selenium is just off the charts, and selenium is so important for a good immune system. A lot of people don't get enough selenium, and it, uh, it is something that unfortunately gets milled out when you go to white, uh, in pure endosperm flour. So that's the transition. The question is what happens to the nutrients? Um, just like the macronutrients, like fiber disappears uh, when you, tr you whittle the wheat down to just pure endosperm, um, many of the micronutrients do as well. You lose half the B vitamins easily, uh, some of them more than half. Uh, and folates are, are a particular problem, and vitamin E is, is really lost. If you bleach the flour on top of that, it also destroys the vitamin E and other vitamins as well. 
So that usually that's an oxidation process, and the whole point of those vitamins are they're antioxidants. They're vitamin E, vitamin A. They're defending the baby plant. Again, this is, this is all about what the wheat's trying to do. This is not about us. Uh, the wheat is trying to protect the baby plant, and when you rip it apart and you yank those components away, those antioxidants, which would have normally protected the baby plant, are now exposed to air and oftentimes destroyed, especially if there's bleach or heat added to the system. Um, there's been a little discussion in, about fermentation. Fermentation is important because it helps to get rid of things we like to call anti-nutrients. So there are components in the plants that are um, uh, known to interact negatively with nutrients and prevent them from being absorbed very efficiently by the human body. One good example is phytate. So phytate is the plant's way to store phosphorus. It needs to have a lot of phosphorus for the baby plant to grow. And so it creates this structure. It's a ring molecule with, with phosphorus decorated all around the, the edge of it. And unfortunately, that binds metal really, really tightly and doesn't allow our body to absorb zinc and calcium and uh, copper very well. In the fermentation process, that's broken down. Uh, when the enzymes that were released by the growing plant, or growing baby plant, are allowed to start working on it, that structure disappears, and we can absorb the, the minerals very efficiently. When we do a fast fermentation, or uh, like the commercial industry that goes in four hours, they go from flour to bread, you don't have that option. So the anti-nutrients stay higher and interfere with uh, our absorption, and all the good stuff that comes from fermentation that feeds the uh, bacteria, like Michael and David were talking about, uh, they're not there. You don't give the, the opportunity to make as much of those healthy. So you, you really, the, the commercial process is just a number of whammies, double, triple, uh, out the door. More anti-nutrients, less nutrients because you filtered them out, uh, damages the nutrients that are in there. And then the big question is, well, can you put some of that back? So the industry attempts to put some of those nutrients back into commercial uh, flour for us. Uh, again, selling a solution to the problem without actually fixing the problem. And um, that's where we're really struggling with at this point in time. So it's very easy to answer the question, if you take full grains and you whittle it down to endosperm, is that bad for you nutritionally speaking? The answer is yes. You take out a huge amount of nutritional density. Next question, if you take those fractionated components and you start adding them back together, which a lot of the products you would you see described as whole wheat on the, sh on, the um, on the commercial grocery shelves are actually separated on roller mills and added back together. Do the nutrient density return? And unfortunately, the answer is the title of this talk. It's complicated. Um, and uh, I can give you some. There's not actually a lot of work done on this, and that should be a really big question. But I've been surprised at how difficult it is to find the few papers that I have found. Um, I'll say some simple things about it, and again, this is coming from my background, knowing, working with vitamins and minerals and understanding uh, biochemistry. But the minerals, minerals are inert, nature-made objects. They are the, the copper that's on the outside of your penny. If you dissolve that, it's the same copper that we absorb. Copper is copper. So if you, the copper associates with the brand, if you add 100% of the brand back into the other fractions, most of that copper is going to come back in. So the mineral-wise, probably not in so much bad shape. Now, there's a lot of loss in the milling system, and it's rare that you're going to get back to 100%. But you're not doing so bad with the minerals, and we actually measure that. So we, uh, that's what I do at my lab is I measure uh, mineral content, and we could look at whole wheat, wheats from the gro commercial grocery store, and they had similar mineral densities to community grains and Joe Vanderleet's correctly milled flour. The vitamins are a different story. Um, vitamins are not drug uh, taken out of the ground. Vitamins are created. Uh, we don't create them. That's why they're vitamins. They're created by some other creature. Uh, vitamin B12 is created by bacteria. Uh, many organisms can make their own vitamin C. We can't. We have to extract that from the, from the food sources that we eat. Those are, n because they have to be made and because they're uh, structurally complex, they are more easily damaged. So uh, in particular, the antioxidants, as I was mentioning, vitamin A, vitamin E, those are very sensitive to uh, oxidation stress, heat, and those are the things that happen in a roller mill. You're breaking apart something that normally is together, you're exposing those things to oxygen, you're exposing those things to heat, 
they are incredibly, it would be incredibly unlikely that you would recover the functional vitamins in any significant amount after that kind of exposure. And I think that's where we need to go. There's just not a lot out there on that question. And um, we, need, we need to answer it. Uh, we need funding, we need standardization, we need to get a group of people who are working with the same wheats so we can compare these things because it's very easy to criticize and say, well, you took two bags of flour off the shelf. Um, one was made from, a di from wheat grown up in Sacramento and one was from Montana. They're different, absolutely, they're different. So it's an apples and oranges problem that's really difficult to, tr to make it tractable from the level of me and my lab. I need a team. I need people who are willing to help standardize the, the, the wheat and uh, support the work. So that, leads uh, into the kinds of things I'm working on, so I'll take a, just a few minutes and, and mention that. Um, I, we are measuring mineral density in flour. We've done that with Bob and Community Grains. Uh, we're hoping to work on the vitamins, because I think that's gonna be the real uh, telling, kind of, uh, telling readout to whether or not reconstituted wheat is the same as whole grain. Um, the other issue that we're very interested in is the lack of transparency when you go to the grocery store and you see a product that says whole wheat. And uh, I'm not the best person to talk about that. Maybe in our question and answer session, that's something, Michael, you could address because I know you've talked a lot about that, about the difficulty and the, uh, with not having standards of identity that are rigorous and um, uh, the ability for the, uh, corporate world to sort of hide what they're actually doing and calling it whole wheat. That, that's a, a very big topic. I'll just say that I'm interested in the other side. I'm interested on, in the metrics of that. And there is not a commercially available test to take flour or bread uh, that claims to be whole wheat and very easily, or whole grain, and easily assess if that's true or not. Uh, that doesn't exist. It should exist. And so with help from uh, Steve, uh, who made some uh, nice fractions for us to work with, so we knew we were working with exactly 100% of each fraction, and uh, Bob getting this, this thing rolling, we started the testing. Um, two points, uh, two tests that we worked on that I'll mention just very briefly. One is that molecule, going back to the anti-nutrient molecule I mentioned called phytate. So phytate can be measured. It is, in fact, measured in many nutritional laboratories and is requested for uh, food analysis. The phytate is mainly in the bran, although it's specifically associated with that aluron layer. That's that single layer of living cells that hides right under the bran, just above the endosperm, and helps to sort of fill the endosperm with nutrients. There's also a little bit of phytate in the germ. So we were able to set up a very quick um, analysis in our laboratory of phytate, and we, we, using the pure fractions, saw about over two-thirds of the phytate was in, a, was in the brand, and about less than a third was in the germ, almost nothing in the endosperm. Okay, so now we have a metric. So we started taking uh, commercial wheats, flowers, from the grocery stores, including community grains, and as you would expect, community grains, if you set that at 100% phytate, if you look at all-purpose flour, which is all endosperm from Safeway, 20% or so. So 20% of, of the phytate value that we receive for community grains. That's pretty much right on with what we expected. Because even all-purpose is gonna be contaminated a little bit with bran and a little bit with the germ. So we expected to see a little bit of it there. Uh, when we looked at other whole grain claiming brands, um, they also ranked ra ra rather high and fairly close to community grains. And the issue is, well, that's because our marker is picking up both bran and germ. And it's very easy to add bran back into uh, flour. In fact, it, to make whole grease constituted, you would absolutely have to add the bran back so that the color was right and the texture was right. So phytate was not the optimal marker. So then we moved to something very specific. And there is a protein found in the germ of the seed, of the tissues in the seed that's only in the germ, and in fact is named that way. Uh, the, the acronym for the protein is WGA and the G is germ. So we were able to identify that particular protein and generate 
you use antibodies directed against that protein to actually assess quantitatively inside flowers. And what we were able to find was actually pretty encouraging. So in community grains flour, something we know is, stone, is uh, whole grain, the, if you set that to 100%, that, that second marker at 100%, and you look at endosperm from uh, flowers from Safeway, um, it's almost zero, one or two, just like you expect, almost no germ in a all-purpose flour, very, very low. When we looked at two other brands that claim to be whole grain brand, whole, flour, whole wheat flours, um, that I'm not going to give you the names on, but I'll let you just wonder. Um, they were intermediate. They ranked, if, if, a, if a community grains was 100%, all purpose was zero, they ranked about 40%. And that's very interesting, because if I understand the FDA correctly, they issue a guidance that allows you to call wheat whole wheat that term whole wheat, if it uses 51 or more percent whole grain, and what you do with the rest of the 49 percent is up to you. Um, I hear, yeah, I had exactly that same reaction when I learned that. That's why I really, really said, if you don't know about that already, uh, that's something we should talk about at the Q&A. But I thought it was very interesting that in our early studies, we saw what might be expected knowing what we know about the industry that there was an intermediate level of this particular marker that's very specific to germ, suggesting that not all the germ was added back into that product. Now, there are some issues in that, again, where we started with apples and oranges. We have no idea what wheat varieties they used off the shelf. We didn't try to investigate that. We certainly didn't standardize it. We didn't start with the very same wheat and have one processed through the appropriate whole grain approach versus the commercial milling and then try to add back. We really need to do that. And that, that I think, at least in trying to be scientifically rigorous about it, I wouldn't be comfortable moving forward until we could do that kind of standardization. I think that's absolutely essential. But uh, those are the two markers we've been working on. There are others that we have uh, in the back of our mind that we would like to start moving forward with, assuming that we could get these first two rolling and um, I think that's basically all I have to say. Yeah, that's great. Mm -hmm.